All right, everybody, I have on Susie Veers, and she's a doula, a childbirth educator, and she is very passionate about helping moms create the birth that they love um, and gaining confidence in their body and abilities and in their birthing team, which we know is so important. And I'm really, really excited to chat with her today. I don't get the opportunity to interview a lot of other doulas. And so um, I'd love to just kind of pick her brain and um, and have her talk about her work with us. So I'm really excited that she's here today. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. I am such a birth nerd and it's so fun to just nerd out with other people who also love moms and also just want moms to have the best experience and feel super empowered in their journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she told me right before we were recording that she's coming off of like two nights of working and no sleep. And just like that on call life is so, so real in the work that we do. And um, so like, I relate to that of days where you got like an hour of sleep and you have to like keep functioning. So good for you. And like, thank you for still taking time to do this interview, even though like you haven't slept in two days. <laughs> of course. Oh my God. I love what you do so much. I am a huge fan of your podcast. So thank you for having me here, even though I'm sure that I might kind of um, stumble a little bit, but thank you for your patience. Yes, of course. I feel like I stumble all the time though. Like sometimes when I'm listening back to podcasts, I just blame it on like mom brain, right? I'm like, I feel like I just switched my words there, like, or I just like left out a word or I said <laughs> the wrong thing. And I'm like, I'm sure people just get the gist of like what I'm saying, because, you know, you can decipher it pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'd love for you just to kind of talk about what made you get into wanting to be a doula and in the doula work that you do. Yeah, actually birth was really a terrifying thought to me when I had um, my first daughter and I am a mom of loss. I lost my first pregnancy at 14 weeks. And then my first birth with Zoe was an un unplanned emergency C-section um, where I didn't have a lot of support and it was very scary and very out of control. Um, so I had kind of just chalked up the, the whole birth thing as that's really hard and it really sucks. And that was just how I felt about it. Um, after I had Zoe, I joined a new mom's group where I became really close friends with the midwifery student. And as we'd go hiking, we, we'd hike every week. She gave me a place where she really helped me process all the trauma that I went to the, the big feelings about my loss, the uncertainty that I felt came with birth. And she helped me see, like, I really believe that I went, you know, if you're hiking, and you are somewhere absolutely gorgeous and it's a beautiful day, but all you do is look down at your feet and you think, this is hard. This is hard. I'm never going to make it. What if I fall? What if I trip? You know, like that's kind of how I went through birth the first time. And I thought that was very normal. I didn't realize that there was this way you could go through birth where you could be grounded and centered and respected and just have a really positive bonding experience with your family. And she opened that door to me and made that really available. And so when I had my second daughter, Hazel, I was much more educated. I was much more supported and I made much more, I made very smart decisions about building my team and my doula and my midwife, we had moved again. So it wasn't that friend. I didn't get to have her as my midwife, but my team just made the experience so great. So after my second daughter, Hazel, was born, when she was about a year, I did a career jump. I had been in finance and then stayed home for a while. And then I went back and did my doula training. And I've been doing it ever since. I'm about just coming up on my fifth birthday as a doula. And I've worked with over 200 families. It's um, still a challenge, but incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In what ways would you say that it's a challenge? Oh, you know, sometimes we do have to process those feelings of, of uncertainty. I sometimes feel that with some of my moms still, and sometimes it, we, the, where I live, we have a very, there are some hospitals that have pretty low C-section rates and others where the C-section rate is well over 30%, 35, close to 40%. Um, and so we also have like 
are out of hospital midwives. Their C-section rates are so low. It's insane. Um, and so not only are the outcomes different at those places, but really the experience as well, where, um, you know, if you're, if we're, if I'm going with a client into one of those hospitals with a higher C-section rate, sometimes you just don't get as much of a say, right? Like sometimes they're very busy and you feel that and you might just be told no on some things. Um, and so it is very frustrating when you're kind of caught between, um, what you know is possible for a mother say she's been pushing for an hour and she hasn't had, hasn't had her baby yet. If they say, sorry, it's been an hour. Your baby hasn't moved. You, um, baby's not going to fit. Let's go do a surgery. Sometimes you don't even get it stay. Even if you say, no, she's not ready. Um, and that's just how it is. Whereas, yeah, it's just, it's so sad to see that kind of behavior, especially coming out of some of the learning institutions where they're actually mm. training people. Right. Right. But I think in the learning institutes, it's almost, I think that they do have higher C-section rates. They have higher episiotomy rates, forceps rates, because these people have to get practice in doing these things. Oh my so, God. That's what my partner always tells me when I complain about it. He's like, yeah. yeah, but they're in school to learn how to do surgeries. One time I was told I was with a mom. We had been there about 24 hours. She was great. Baby was great. Doctor came in and was like, the OR is open. We're going to head back. And I said, wait, why is mom? Okay. Like, what are you seeing? That's telling you we need this. It's like, no, 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 she's fine. You've just been here a while. And I said, okay, what about baby? What category? I always, I've learned to ask like, what category is the heart rate? And they'll tell you, is it one, two, or three? One is great and happy. Two is a wide range usually is decent, like yellow. And three is okay. Like, you know, we need to be paying attention here. Um, baby was still category one. He's like, no, we're just out of time. And so luckily in her case, she stood really firm and she was like, Good. no, I'm not going back. And literally four hours later, she had her baby like, and it was just time, but that whole thinking, oh, the OR is open. Let's go back. Just not great. That's insane. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> That just like blows my mind and obviously like makes me see red as well um, because there's like just no autonomy at all given in those places mm -mm. for birth. Like there's just like, oh, this is your body, but we don't care. Like we're busy and, and to be that blatant about it. Like, I feel like sometimes at least they like try to make up an excuse, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> but that was just blatantly yeah. like, okay, like, Hey, the OR is open. You want to get this thing going or what? Like, let's do it. Like we're not supposed to have the OR open. So. <laughs> Oh my yeah. gosh. That I mean, is I don't so see wild. that behavior often, but it does, it does happen. And it happens in those busier hospitals. And it unfortunately happens in, in our training hospital as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, so how, I guess like when you are getting a, a client who, you know, is birthing in one of these like places mm -hmm. that, you know, that that's it, like, how do you prepare them for like advocacy? Um, in those settings when you know that they're more likely to have a, a cesarean just based on the place they're choosing to birth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just, it's not just a, a C-section either. I was with one mom who on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, her water had broken and she had a fever. Mm. And You know, that's kind of like whenever somebody's water breaks, they're all, you know, everyone's worried, like your risk for an infection has gone up. And she had a fever every, you know, she felt sick. Like she had initially wanted a, a natural labor, but she was like, so dizzy. She was like, I have to stay in bed. And so we did an epidural and yet she couldn't get an antibiotic for like 12 hours because she was like 0.1 degree underneath what their threshold was. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, you know, on both ends of the spectrum, not, we're trying to advocate for not too little not too much care that we're interfering with a birth that's unfolding perfectly and naturally and not too little care in those points where um, a, a mom actually does need something like bringing awareness, getting a, a doctor to the bedside, 
pointing things out, asking. Um, and sometimes that makes me a little angry because that was not my job description, but that's something that I've learned to do over time. Um, but yeah, for moms going into those high, those busy hospitals, I always help them. I tried to talk about what it means to be busy and how we feel when we're overwhelmed and how like, you know, we assume going into a hospital, we're going to receive the best care, but sometimes we don't realize that the systems make that unlikely or difficult. Um, just to give the care providers like a little bit more credit, I think I've been a little tough on them. Um, another mom I worked with, she was doing an induction, also wanted a natural birth and got all the way to the end where she's pushing and her OB, we were again in one of these like more intervention friendly hospitals was so amazing. And as she was pushing, it was taking a little bit longer, you know, it wasn't, oh, two minutes and here's your baby. It was, we were about an hour in and the option was presented to do, um, like an episiotomy and help with forceps. And she said, no, she didn't want that. And not only did the doctor listen, but she sat there at the foot of the bed, offering encouragement and support and love. And she also, in that time, um, a mom came in through the ER that was one of her patients and the ER, they like paged her and told her, but the ER was trying to send her home. And the OB said, no, that is my patient. If she's here, I will see her. She prescribed a medication to a mother in another room while remembering an allergy. And she did two other things that I can't really remember what they were, but four moms also in labor at the same time. We need to understand that our providers are often overworked and overwhelmed and busy and systems that aren't supporting them and giving us the proper attention as well. That it's not always like, heart not in the right place, but resources allocated in ways that aren't often reasonable. And that's not a provider's fault. Like they can be doing their best. Um, so just knowing like it is okay to speak up for yourself, that you should know to ask questions and you should ask, um, you should ask, like, if there's changes in your labor and you're worried and, or an intervention's offered, like, yes, ask, what are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? What if we wait an hour? And so often when you ask, okay, are we safe to wait an hour before we have to make that decision? The answer is, oh yeah, that's totally fine. And sometimes if you just keep repeating that question, all of a sudden, four or five hours have gone by and, oh my God, your baby is here, you know? And so it becomes like irrelevant. Um, that's actually the mom that um, was told, let's go back to the OR right now, just because it's open. Like, that's exactly what we did was like, can we just regroup about this in an hour? Um, and that way you can, can kind of find that balance between getting care if you need it um, because they'll tell you no, and they'll give you a reason, and hopefully they have some a reason based on logic. And if you don't need it, if it's just, oh, we're busy, and I'm trying to rush you or hurry you along, or I'm not giving you individualized care, I just, you know, if you have a doctor that like, well, I just break everybody's water at seven when I get here, mm -hmm. then you can typically see that and their reasons that they're giving for why they're proposing it. And you can say, well, actually that's not for me. And you can have that moment of, of self-advocacy and getting closer to that individualized personal care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that there's a lot of things that goes against OBs too. I recently interviewed a high-risk OB and she was just talking about even just like the fear of litigation that happens when um, women are trying to be back or they are going past 40, 41 weeks and their fear of being sued versus like if they do an induction and they can control like every single thing, even if there is an adverse outcome, they're less likely to be sued than if they like let things unfold on their own and didn't intervene and like how that controls so much of like what they do. Um, and it just sucks. It sucks that like the system like isn't supporting them. 
Um, but it also doesn't justify the way that women are treated in labor or their lack of autonomy or informed consent. And that it just has to be like a radical change, which is where I feel like the importance of having a doula is so, so good because we can help explain some of this and we can help even like make OBs look better, be like, okay, like obviously like they're better or they're busy. And when you have a doula present, they're more likely to have a good birthing experience. So we're making everybody in the situation like look a little bit better, you know? So it's, it's, yeah, it's the, the system like has to change from the inside out, which is where I think doulas play a vital role in showing up to these births and, um, preparing women for labor. Um, and I know that you have an education birthing course. I'd, I'd love for you to kind of speak on like maybe the difference that you see in people who might take a birth education course, to prepare themselves, um, like what that might look like or prepare them for versus not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a really important thing to note, you know, back when I was in, um, when I studied business a long time ago, there was a really good book that I read called the Emit, and in it, it talked about when you're building an organization. I know this is like, seems like it's not going to be related, but I promise it is. Everybody needs a job and that job has to be defined and have a role. Um, I think sometimes we we overgive to our our care teams. Um, we assign we think that they have roles that are actually ours as either the laboring mother or the support team, you know, like a doula or a specific care person that's hired to fill that role. Um, I often will hear OB say something like, "This is the problem." Like, this is the obstacle I see. For example, your contractions have spaced out. Um, here are my tools. And their tools are medicine, right? right? They are medical practitioners and they practice medicine. So their job is literally to give you a medicine like Pitocin or Mesoprostol or break your bag of waters. It's literally their job as interventions, Right. And when we think about all the other really important things, um, movement, staying hydrated, eating food, stress management, um, we know that stress can play such a huge role in the labor process and that fear when moms enter a state of fear, labor can slow down. It can also stop. Um, but those things are not our care providers jobs. Those are not medicine in an ideal world. Yes. They could be, but when you come to those conversations as a mother, you need to be prepared for when you ask the question, what are the alternatives? You need to be prepared to say, is one of my alternatives movement? Because that's something in your control. But when the OB walks out of the room, they have no control over if you're going to get up and walk around or get on a birth ball or do something that might help your contractions stay close together. And sometimes it's okay. It's very natural for contractions to stay far apart. And sometimes that is a legitimate concern. Um, and yes, you know, you asking the questions can help figure that out. But moms who take childbirth courses have been given almost a playbook or an instruction manual. So when it comes to the things that are their job, like it is your job to know how to breathe through a contraction. And it is your job to know, to manage your mindset and to manage your stress and to ask your questions and to speak up. And it's not fair for anybody to have a job that they have no education or training for. It's just not right for anybody. Um, and so taking a childbirth class is essentially saying, hey, I know that I'm going to be doing something really important and my job is not everything. I don't have to know everything. I will not do everything. I will not be managing, monitoring my own blood pressure. I'm not going to be giving myself Pitocin, but I will know what I can do in early labor, um, in active labor. I'll have a reasonable, pl reasonable plan for when I'm starting to push what I'd like that to look like and what I want the golden hour to look like. And I'll have enough tools to be able to improvise and change my plans 
if I have evolving needs that change during the birth process. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that that explanation is perfect. Um, Yes. I love that description. I've never really heard it like described that way. And I'm going to steal some of those, (laughs) but I'm (laughs) describing it in the future because that is so true. Like you do, you get this tool belt and, um, and I think that so often we are relying, like you said, just kind of like on our care team at the hospital to provide everything, but that's not their job. Like our nurses, I, I mean, I've been so blessed and almost like most people that I talk to have amazing nurses. Like they're so awesome. So many of the births that I show up to, like, they're just, they're rock stars. Um, but it's not their job to like do certain things, you know, like I've had nurses that are like getting on the beds with them, like jiggling the belly and (laughs) breathe, being like, okay, breathe, like doing that thing, but you don't get that with every experience. And so, um, having that tool belt and not expecting them to teach you how to like move through your contractions, how to do every single thing I think is, is very important, a very important note to take that we need to take some responsibility for our birthing experiences and, and how Mm -hmm. like our birth is going to play out. Um, I, I think that a misconception for a lot of people when it comes to maybe taking a childbirth education course or having a birth plan is that, well, my plan is just, I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to get an epidural. So why would I need any of these resources? So I'd love for you to maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I actually love that you brought that up because, um, it's, if you are getting an epidural, you still need to know quite a bit about the birth process. You still have to deal with contractions until you can get an epidural. You need to know how to go to the hospital. You need to know how to time contractions. And then after you get an epidural, it's not like, it's not like you just hit an easy button. Um, sometimes I think that that our expectation with an epidural is that it's going to make the birth process so much easier because we don't have to think about the, the physical side, the pain of contractions, which if you have an epidural that works is true. On the other hand, when you have epidurals, like there is an increase in the C-section rate. Um, if you look at the listening mother survey, if you look at there's, there's just so, so many studies that confirm that there's more risk when we start interfering with the birth process. So you need to know like, what foods can you eat? If you're on clear liquids, what does that mean for you? Are you getting protein? Because what if you have to push for three hours and you haven't eaten for 18, like that's not an easy position to be in. And how are you going to feel? Um, pretty much every mom I work with after you have an epidural, it's very common for babies to have more heart rate dips. And some of that can be okay. Even a category one baby can have the presence of some heart rate dips, but how are you going to manage the emotions around that when you're not knowing what's normal and not, but you're watching a trace on a computer screen next to you and nobody's telling you, are you going to feel like you're in an emergent situation? What are you going to do if it turns into a category two? What conversations are you going to do? How are you going to circle back and manage that stress? Because you actually have a lot of plates spinning. If you think about those Chinese plate spinners, even with an epidural. So you still need to know how to advocate for yourself. Um, And you need to know a little bit more about um, other drugs that are commonly used with epidurals, such as Pitocin, because in an ideal world, we'd always get the perfect care with drugs like that. But unfortunately, we don't. Um, Pitocin is one of 12 drugs in the world that's on a high alert list, meaning that a mistake can cause devastating effects. And sometimes some, um, like in, in our hospitals, when they use it during labor, they'll bump it up. They'll bump the the level up every 30 minutes, but it takes 90 minutes for it to reach a steady state in your body. So it is very possible for it to become too high 
you need to know enough to recognize like, is there a point in time where I might have to advocate for myself and say, Hey, can we turn this down or can we turn this off? Because often those conversations, when I see that happening, if I'm in a hospital with a really low C-section rate, that's a very common practice. But in these hospitals with higher C-section rates, nurses, OBs will often say, oh, but I'll always, no, this is an induction. No, we need the contractions close together. It only goes up. And so then you have to ask questions like, well, what if we turn it off and wait for an hour? What if we turn it off until we get to a category one heart rate and then start again? What if we go at a slower pace? Um, you also need to know like what positions are really great because not only will you be uncomfortable if you lay on your back the whole time or in a semi-sitting position because um, we need to move, right? Like even when we sleep, we move, but it's, it helps babies come down in your pelvis and rotate if you change positions regularly. And you may have a nurse that helps you move regularly and you may need to ask for that support. So if you have an epidural, there's still a lot on your plate. Um, so it really, it really does make sense to take a childbirth course so that you know what to do and what the flow of your birth is going to be like and how to advocate for yourself and and what some of those best practices are that just make the epidural births go a little bit smoother so that you can be very proactive and you can be very chill and you can laugh and watch movies and you can also play a card game or bring your Nintendo Switch and have fun. Um, I don't want to make it sound so scary. There's so many ways we can make birth actually quite exciting. Um, and memorable in a positive way too, but we do need to be watching out for those other things as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And not to mention like 10 to 15% of the time, your epidural might not work. And yeah. so that's like a tough thing that people aren't prepared for either. Like I had a friend who was like, I'm going to the hospital getting an epidural. Hers did not work. Um, and, but also because she had the epidural, even though it wasn't working, she was still confined to the bed. Like you can't get mm -hmm. up and walk just because your epidural is not working. So okay, what comfort measures can we take then? Like, what are some tools that I have that might help me in this position versus just laying here? Um, so yeah, I think just that education piece behind it is so, so important. And I'm glad that you touched on Pitocin because I was even thinking about earlier today, I was going to make a reel on it about how like Pitocin is not, it's not regulated or the FDA has not approved Pitocin for induction yet. It's used constantly, mm -hmm. um, which for me, the FD, I mean, I don't care a lot about what the FDA says. Um, I know like in some places they're trying to ban like herbalism and homeopathy. So, um, but, but it's just funny because most, um, like practices, medical practices, medical institutions do go by that. And they're like, oh, well, this isn't regulated by the FDA. Like they tell you that in pregnancy, like I don't, these herbs aren't regulated by the FDA. So don't take them. These things aren't, mm -hmm. but when it comes to Pitocin, it's like, okay, but that isn't approved by the FDA to use for induction. Yet. Oh, so it's, many drugs in pregnancy are that way. Mesoprostol right. or Cytotec is the same. It's a, a drug that they use to induce labor, but it's a drug that's approved to treat stomach ulcers and not approved to use in pregnancy. But if you're having an induction, you're probably going to have both of those drugs. Right. Um, it's very strange. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But Pitocin is on that list of drugs that isn't great. And um, I also, I heard an interview that like a different nurse did. She was an L and D nurse and she actually was part of a litigation team. Like she would get called to witness things that happened. Wow. And she had like worked at a, a place where basically this one doctor always said pit to distress. So he knew that he would put Pitocin on because the baby would end up getting distressed and he would do it so high until your uterus is completely exhausted. Your baby's in distress so that he could just do a C-section. Um, so it's a very powerful drug. And most OBs are not practicing this way. This was, you know, she was talking about a very specific case, but that's the power of Pitocin. Like it can tire out your uterus. It can put your baby in distress. Um, and so I think asking to back off, asking to come down, asking to take a break are all super reasonable things to see, is this causing my baby to be in distress? Is this 
part of the reason, you know, these things are happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have a lot of qualms around Pitocin. And I think that there's a time and a place and it is overused all the time. So, um, right. but then on the other hand, if you have an epidural, your IV can slow down your labor, the amount of fluids right. you're getting, right. you're not moving around. So it can become necessary. Um, can, I'm sorry. I know that you're asking the questions, but can I like talk about a couple safety points with Pitocin? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I actually, what you were saying, I see all the time, the pit to distress, I would say at least half the time when I'm in the hospital and Pitocin is being used, the upper threshold used is until somebody is not handling it, whether it's mom or baby. Um, and it does not have to be that way. One, there's a little monitor called an IUPC that if you feel like that's happening, you can request. It's a little bit more invasive of a monitor. It goes inside um, your cervix. You can't really feel it because you typically have an epidural at this point. We're talking for epidural moms on a drug like Pitocin. Um, and it can tell you exactly how strong your contractions are. Um, whereas the external ones only tell you how long and how frequent. The internal one tells you how long, how frequent, and how strong. And so you can ask, they know that at 200 um, Montevideo units is how they say, like how they measure how strong the, the contractions are. You're having enough contractions to progress through labor. So if you feel like pit to distress is maybe the strategy happening on your team um, with your care team, ask for an IUPC. You'll know exactly how strong they are and they will stop when it's at 200 because they will have that number and they will be charting that number. And if they go over that number, they'll have to account for it. Um, so it's a piece of information that can help protect you. Um, somebody's car alarm is going on outside. So I apologize if you can hear I that. I can't hear it. Uh -uh. <laughs> okay. Um, two other things to keep in mind, Pitocin at level six, we all respond differently. So it's not exactly exact. But according to the package insert, Pitocin at a level six is what normal contract would cause the, the force of normal contractions. So it is possible that you may have to go up from that. Um, but, you know, that would be, that's a good checkpoint to keep in your mind. Like, am I at six? By the time you get to level 10 on the Pitocin, your body actually starts making its own oxytocin in response to the Pitocin. So if you're going above level 10, it's possible going from zero to one or one to two is not the same as going from 10 to 11 or 11 to 12 or higher because now your body's like kicking in more and more and more, um, which cannot be measured in any way other than from like, are you or your baby in distress? So at 10, it's a great time to do like a or anytime you're above 10, just know if you're seeing heart rate dips or if you are, you know, if something's going on with your blood pressure and anyone's in distress, you just ask to start coming down or to turn it off, wait until baby's been at category one for an hour and then go up, but more slowly, right? Looking for that minimal threshold where you see progress instead of how much and how fast can we go? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, those are really good points. Um, I'm taking some notes as you're saying some of this too. <laughs> um, I also feel like that's where like doulas come into play though. Cause like you're saying, like just having other tools. So um, I think that we, in hospitals, they want to see labor go at this certain rate, at this certain pattern. And that's not how all labors go. So we don't need to always rush things. Um there are times when things are concerning. So you do want to like consider different things being introduced, but also having a doula on board or having some birth education, as you were saying earlier, is like, okay, like, you know, things have spaced out and slowed down a ton is what can I do? Movement, um, pumping, like what, what are things I can do to like get things going when they've slowed down? So like having that tool belt is great because when they come in and be like, okay, we want to start you on Pitocin. It's like, all right, actually, can you bring me a pump? I want to try that first or whatever it is like, all right, we're going to try a few different positions. And then like, we'll talk about this again later. So mm -hmm. having those tools is so, so important. Um, 
because yeah, Pitocin does have quite a few risk factors. So I, I would try to avoid that if you can, um, unless like absolutely needed, but I've also been at births where it was like a 40 hour labor <laughs> and, um, just baby wasn't doing amazing. And they decided to just do a tiny bit of Pitocin. And like two hours later, the baby was here. And I don't think they got, they only did, it was below 10 the whole time. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's times where like it, it has like benefited or like we've exhausted a lot of resources and been like, okay, like maybe it is time to talk about this. What does it look like? Um, but again, I think that that's also where a doula really comes into play to have those conversations with you to talk about what is it going to look like? What are potential mm -hmm. risks? What, um, you know, maybe some of the things that the OB isn't telling you or, um, really explaining. So, um, having a birthing team is very, is very important. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about like birth plans. Cause I know that that's something that you help your clients create. Um, yeah. and birth plans don't always like go according to plan. So I, the one ob huge objection that I see to people making a birth plan, they're like, yeah, but birth plans don't go according to plan. Like, or scared of like, I really want an unmedicated birth, but if I write this plan down and I decide to get an epidural, then I completely failed. And this birth plan is like out the window. Um, so I'd love for you to maybe talk about like, what are some of the benefits of having a birth plan and how do you make it actually work for you? Yeah, I think birth plans are crucial and not in the point that they're like, this is my plan and I won't ever go make a decision about this because it's not about, it's not necessarily about dictating exactly how your birth will go, because if we have a true respect for our bodies and ourselves, we will meet needs as they evolve. And we will recognize that our body will labor in its own very unique way that maybe we can't plan for. But what we can do with the birth plan is it makes sure that we have considered all of our options. And so we know what our choices would be in an ideal situation. It also gives us a, a way to communicate, um, you know, what our values are so that if you, if you do want something unique in your birth, you can ask for it. Um, I work with moms who have all different types of birth plans. I have one, um, I have a lot of moms who are like, I am very in intervention averse. I do not want intervention unless it's absolutely needed. But there are other moms. I had a mom at Christmas who said, the only thing that matters to me is I want my baby by Christmas. And she didn't care about, okay, do I have a surgery? Do I have this? She wanted her baby by Christmas and that's valid, right? Um, it was within her window of a full term and um, she did choose an induction and her birth plan let her communicate those values. Um, but when we go into the, the hospital or even a, a birth center birth or home birth, we can't control the people that are going to be part of our story. And we're also in a very vulnerable place where we can't necessarily communicate who we are very well or negotiate very well, right? So if you have a birth plan, you have a great communication tool. So everybody that walks into your room will most likely read it and they'll be able to tailor care to you. And most times I think that providers are very respectful to plans if it's well communicated and it's thought out. Yes, there are the exceptions to the rule, the jerks, the people who just do things their way, but I really feel like that's the exception and not the average. Um, if you have a plan, you know your options, and I don't think anything can be more helpful than that. And you will also get support. So when you come into those conversations about benefits, risks, alternatives, if you've said, hey, I'm natural, like my plan is natural. I want a lot of support. I want a lot of encouragement around that. People can acknowledge that and they will often give you more, more alternatives or more time or more support in trying to reach the goal that you had. Even if they're saying like, Hey, I'm starting to worry about this. I want you to keep an eye about on it and start thinking about it too. Um, I, it very much changes how you're treated in the labor process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I definitely think it can be used as that for sure. 
Um, and yeah, just knowing your options. I think the flexibility is super, super important. I love what you said, just kind of like being attuned to your body and your needs and like that it is evolving. And the whole point is pretty much to feel informed, to like know that, okay, like, although this is my ideal situation, I know that if it doesn't go that way, that I still have these other options, that I still have mm -hmm. the tools in my tool belt to, to help with that. Um, I think that we're still doing like a lot of work in like educating women on what true informed consent is. And when it comes to birth, because we're just so used to being like, okay, take your pants off. I'm doing an exam, you know, like type thing yeah. versus like, uh, and we're used to that. We're not used to having conform, like informed consent, like over our own bodies. Um, so what exactly is that? And then how do you advocate for yourself in labor to have informed consent? Yeah. I mean, it's important to know, like, this is your body, your baby, your birth, and therefore anybody in your space is essentially in a, a consultant around you and you can take their advice or not. You can have your plan or not. One of the things that I like often will see maybe the lines of informed consent crossed is around cervical checks. And some people are like, totally fine. Love the information. Don't mind cervical checks. They do increase the risk of infection. And for some people, they can be painful. Um, for a lot of, a lot of the moms that I work with, um, are sexual abuse victims. And so cervical checks can be extraordinarily triggering, especially if they're done without much warning or in routine ways. Um, a couple of ways that we manage that is we'll put on the birth plan, no cervical checks until a certain point in labor or until you ask. Um, and then I have you, whatever you decide, you put it on your birth plan and then you should take your birth plan to your care provider, to one of your prenatal appointments and talk through it with your doctor and ask them where you're likely to get support and where you're not likely to get support. And so for something with cervical checks, like if you want limited cervical checks, whether it's none, just one before you're pushing or as needed as requested by you, or um, maybe after an epidural is placed are all things that I've had people request. Your doctor can put that in your chart. So when you go into triage and they're like, okay, it's time for us to do a cervical check because this is the way we do things. You don't have to say, here's my whole story. While I'm in labor and I'm in a vulnerable situation, let me tell you how important and why it's important I don't do a cervical check. You can have that conversation with your doctor when you are still pregnant and you're not actually in labor. And they can note it in your chart. And then the only conversation your partner has, your husband, your whoever is with you, your doula, your mother, a friend that's with you, all they have to say is it's noted in my chart. We're not doing a cervical check until XYZ point or unless XYZ happens. And that's something you can do with all of your choices. Um, if it's things are noted in your chart, then you don't have to negotiate in labor. I don't think that negotiating in labor is necessarily great. And you also won't get like occasionally, like one of the things that I tell my moms to do with epidurals is to labor down, which is essentially like after you you reach 10 centimeters, you wait until baby's head is so low, it's visible at the, the, the output of the, the vagina or up to two hours is where most of the studies have brought that. Um, that's not, a lot of hospitals feel like they don't want to give you time for that. Like, oh, here, we just start pushing at 10. And sometimes when you're negotiating things like that, you'll get tons of support. And sometimes you'll get, like I had one doctor say, oh my God, I love laboring down. What a great idea. I'll be back in 15 minutes. Oh, geez. You know? <laughs> So it's kind of like they give you support, but they don't give you support, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that can be a, a very confusing point to be in. But if you had a birth plan and you took it, you know, you took it to your doctor and you said, I want to wait as long as possible before I start pushing. And it's noted in your birth plan. 
then you've one practice talking about your needs, listening to the pros, the cons, gathering more information if you need it, making a choice that you matters to you. And so when you're back in the hospital and that, if that conversation comes up again, it's not the first time that you've talked through it and it will come so naturally and so easily. And so most of the time you're going to get support because it's in your birth plan and that's what you want. If you're with one of those rare providers who doesn't want to listen, it's noted in your chart and you've had practice going through with speaking up for yourself, which makes a really big difference. And it actually starts to become really easy once you've done it a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's really great advice. Like the taking your birth plan to your provider, because that's like where you start to learn to speak up for yourself and like have some, some advocacy, because as you were saying that, I'm like, it's so easy for us just to like give in and to conform. And I feel like it's just how women have kind of been brought up in this country. Um, also we kind Uh of have this like medical complex that like whatever our doctors say goes and, um, that like, we don't have like real say over ourselves, like, oh, well, they're the doctor. They probably know better. But as you said earlier, they know, they know medicine and, um, and there's so much research and evidence out there that, um, that also kind of goes against how a lot of OBs practice, like a lot of things that Um, like I had somebody reach out to me recently and she said, my doctor told me that I have to push on my back. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Um, you know, they, they wanted to schedule her induction. They wanted her, she said, I'd like to push in different positions. They're like, you can labor in different positions, but when it comes time to pushing, you have to push on your back. And so I printed, I sent her the ACOG link (laughs) of Mm -hmm. saying like this, is not supported by evidence. And if your doctor's telling you that you have to push on your back, they're not following ACOG, which is their general ruling body. Like, you know, so like show them like, Hey, like, you know, I just did some research on my own and ACOG supports pushing in different positions, even with an epidural, um, you know, and just present it to them. And, and then you you're having these conversations beforehand. So then like, when it does come to labor, if they're like, okay, you need to get on your back it's as simple as like, just not getting on your back of being like, I'm comfortable in the position I'm in, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and just staying there. And I think laboring down is like such a good, a good, good trick because our tip, because when you start pushing at 10 centimeters, it doesn't necessarily mean your body's ready to push yet. And you can tire out. You can be pushing for hours longer. You can start getting a swollen cervix. Like there's so much that can happen, um, when you start pushing too early. So, um, it's, yeah that's like a very good tool to have in your tool belt, tool belt as well. But I think having those conversations, taking the birth plan in does start to open that up and, and get you more familiar with having potentially tough conversations, but at least like advocating like a little bit and, Mm -hmm. and also seeing like how your provider feels about things. Like I, I do think birth plans are crucial, but I also feel like we take them in too late. And then we find out that our provider does not have the same thoughts on birth as we do. And that can be really, really frustrating um, when you're like, okay, like I don't want to be induced. And they're like, well, we don't let anybody go past 40 weeks. And you're like, oh, like I didn't know <laughs> that like we had different views on this, but there's, that's why like getting this information as early as possible. Um, but also knowing just because they say you can't go p- past 40 weeks doesn't mean that you can't go past 40 weeks. So it's really knowing like, okay, what, what can I say no to? Um, how do I advocate in this situation and what are the actual risks and benefits? And mm-hmm. like, what does research say on its own? Like, what am I comfortable doing? Um, so yeah, it's, Cause with birth, there are risks, right? Like there are, there are, yes. And so it's, you, you do need to have that information and, and take those, those, all of that into consideration. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's a whole, there's so much, there's so much like when it comes to birth and so much that goes into it from like the top down and you, your intuition, your autonomy, um, is central. Like it's key in all of this and that we're just kind of treated like an assembly line often in the birthing Mm -hmm. system. So I think taking a childbirth education course, having a birth plan, having a doula, any of these things 
would, even if you just do one of them would be so, so highly beneficial to anybody having a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Preparation makes a big difference. And I mean, also when we're prepared, we feel calm, right? Like it's so normal. Anxiety is part of the birth process. It's part of the preparation process. So if you're feeling anxious, there's nothing that's not bad. That's actually good. And hopefully that anxiety leads you to ask questions and to build resources and to ultimately do the things that you need to take care of yourself and make sure that you will be safe. And I've had plenty of people walk into these hospitals that are, um, you know, the higher C-section hospitals, but because they put so much effort into their communication and their preparation that it's like, they're almost so aligned with this birth that they've planned that things go very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, before you wrap up, can you let us know where people can connect with you, find more information about you, um, and look at the things that you have to offer, like your childbirth education course? Oh yeah, absolutely. So my Instagram is typically where, where I hang out. Um, it's at she births bravely. Um, and my website, if, if you would like to check out the course or learn more about it, it's at shebirdsbravely.com slash learn. Um, and then I have a fun little quiz on my website as well. Shebirdsbravely.com slash quiz. What does your birth plan say about your personality? And I think it's really helpful in seeing like, hey, what makes me so unique and how do I communicate who that is? So as you're going through those first steps um, towards a birth plan, it helps maybe see some of those things that you wouldn't consider special about yourself, but actually are quite unique and are very important for others to see and know about you. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, I will include all of that in the show notes. And I just want to thank you so much for taking time to come on the podcast and have this conversation with me. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure.